Chair recognizes the <coughs> Minority Caucus leader, <coughs> Leader Beverly, to speak to the next special order. Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you see a turtle on a fence post, I won't. Uh, you know he or she did not get there on their own. And I believe that to be true for about seven, eight years, sit beside the dean. And about three years ago, I saw a turtle climbing a fence. And for a brief moment in time, that turtle was sitting on top of a fence post, but I watched him until he jumped off and felt, well, he actually fell on the other side. And I was like, maybe a turtle did climb a fence post. Maybe he wasn't put there on his own, but what I learned from that is that what Representative Smyrie, the Dean has showed me, is that everyone has a perspective. Everyone has a perspective. He has, given me the grace, and our caucus the grace, to accept whatever defects I have, whatever defects we have, we own them. And whatever accomplishments that we will achieve in this life, they belong to God's alone. He has a perspective to go down to Brunswick when Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. He had the perspective to teach us how to go through reapportionment with our heads up, even though local control seemed to disappear right in front of us. He has a perspective to vote on the budget. I think there's only one that he's never voted for, and I think I had something to do with that. And I apologize, because he's like, house first, you second. We have been in negotiations ad nauseum around sports betting, medical marijuana, hate crimes, the budget, and on and on and on. And the one thing that he has always given me is perspective. And he's done that for all of us. So if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know that he or she did not get there alone. And Dean Smyrie has allowed us all to sit on a fence post from time to time. I'm gonna miss you, my dear brother. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. There come those times uh, that you don't really look forward to. <coughs> and um, I've cried about today. I've been happy about today. I've cried because of what, of being selfish and knowing that I will not have my friend here on a daily basis. I've cried for the loss to this house of one of the greatest that's ever walked through these halls. But I've been happy because I know that um, he is capping off a a uh, very distinguished career of public service in a uh, very distinguished way. Um, you know, since I came into this position, I cannot remember, I've tried to remember now for a few weeks, a significant issue that Dean Smyrie has not been there to be a rock to lean on, uh, a source of wisdom. Um, and, you know, we can't tell all the times we've talked, I guess, uh, till we write our books, right? Um, but uh, so many times, saving hope, uh, the transportation funding reform bill, criminal justice reform, um, hate crimes, citizens arrest, um, and uh, expansion of gaming. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. 
Um, I don't have the words to say how much he has meant. Um, but he always did it in a with a spirit of um, um, trying to find a consensus, and he always did it with civility. Uh, many, many times he has been the calming influence on the waters when the storms were kind of raging around us. I thought of today and I thought of the uh, passage from Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. It's my honor at this time to recognize for a special order a special child of God, Dean Calvin Smyrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you for your kind comments and your kind remarks, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your friendship, your leadership, and um, so day has been one that uh, I kind of dreaded. Carolyn Hughes gave me this, so I'm gonna have to pull it out. <laughs> but um, it has arrived. Sign you die, 2022. So Mr. Speaker, David Ralston, Speaker Pro Tem, Jan Jones, Majority Leader, John Burns, the Whip, Hatchet, Chairman Bonnie Rich, and other officers of the Majority Caucus, Minority Leader James Beverly, Whip David Wilkerson, Chairman Billy Mitchell, my seat mate, all of the other officers serving in the Democratic Caucus, my Columbus delegation, Chairman Richard Smith, Representative Carolyn Hughley, Representative Debbie Buckner, Representative Van Smith, ladies and gentlemen of the House. I rise to address you on my final morning order. For the past 45, 48 years, the citizens of Columbus have allowed me to represent them in this House chamber. Georgia House of Representatives. What an honor and joy it has been for me. I thought qualifying week was going to be rough, uh, but um, this is the toughest moment. And uh, I had not planned on going down to room 230 on qualifying, but I went with Representative Carolyn Hughley to see her qualify, and it made my day go better. Today is more difficult because after 48 years of serving in this chamber, I will not be returning. Do this hallowed chamber for another legislative session. I'm honored that my family, some of my family members are here. My father, 96 years old. Carter Smiley. Turn around so they can see you. P. 
PJ, thank you for being here. I appreciate this very much. Two of my deceased sister, two of her children are here. Robbie Branscombe, thank you for being here. Robbie is my assistant, executive assistant uh, at my office in Synovus. Uh, Francine Foster, thank you for being here, Francine. And my two grandchildren. As you know, I lost my daughter in December of last year, and I, I'm, I want them to be here, Javon and Morgan. So will y'all give them a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Thank you very much. How did my journey and story start? In 1966, I graduated from Franklin American High School in Frankfurt, Germany. My grandfather and father both were Korean military veterans. My grandfather was a master sergeant in the 24th Regiment, and my father was a helicopter pilot and retired as a chief warrant officer. I'm proud of my father because he was a mechanic in the United States Army and he worked on helicopters. He got out of the Army, went to officer's training school, and became a pilot and flew uh, helicopters um, for the United States Army. The military was not for me. <laughs> uh, when I was in Germany, my father, when I was growing up, I used to, he used to dress me in Army uniforms all the time, you know. And I said, Dad, I don't want to be in the Army. <laughs> and he said, you're going, into, you're going to the Army, boy. You're going about your business. <laughs> so unbeknownstly, he, 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 he worked a way for me to go to Morgan State, the ROTC school. So I, we, we sent the application, and he sent one to Tuskegee, and then he sent one to Clark. And of course, in Germany, we got back, and neither school had received my SAT nothing from either school, and that's, that's the mail for you, you know, from Germany. And so a friend of mine, um, a friend of my father's lived down the street, Dr. Robert Threat, who went on to become, as you know, president of Marsh Brown College. So we went down to his house and he said, um, let's take him down to Fort Valley. And, uh, and that's where I ended Fort Valley and um, uh, Fort Valley changed my life. Um, and um, I owe a lot to Fort Valley State University. And, and all of you all know how much I love Fort Valley. Right, right Chairman England? <laughs> I love some Fort Valley State University. And uh, I, um, I uh, didn't do well. I, um, I um, well, you go to school to study. <laughs> and and uh, I, I kind of got a little wavered. And, uh, and um, so I was in my last semester. I was taking a three-hour course and a five-hour course, physical science. And uh, so I ran to the physical science, and I asked Dr. Steele, I said, what's he? He said, well, you got a B plus yet. I don't know what your problem is. So I went up to the business school. My major was business, well, the mine in economics. And um, um, my instructor said, sit down for just a minute. She said, you know what, I met a lot of people, but you got it. You just got it, but you just don't know what to do with it. Now you got it, so, but maybe during summer school, you'll find yourself. I said, you don't know my mother and father, and I, please don't do that. I'm a first married to graduate, don't do that to me. And the football player came by, was a minister now, Reverend Dawson, we went in there together, and we both left crying, and she wouldn't change it, so I went to summer school and then realized that what the course was not going to be offered in Fort Valley. It was going to be offered at University of Wisconsin. I said, oh my Lord, how am I going to get up there? And he said, you can take it correspondingly. Now for young people now, you can take anything what, on the internet. But back then, it was a courier. So I curated my lesson back and forth and took the course and made a B plus through the mail. Could have made an A in the classroom. So one summer, I was in the library, 
and I ran across this poem called The Guy in the Glass. If you read the AJC's paper, they might have did a profile on me, and that was the nucleus of the story. And uh, that poem changed my life. It states, I'm going to do a short version of it. When you get what you want and you struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, then go to a mirror and look at yourself and see what that guy has to say. You may be like Jack Hall and Chisholm or the Plum and think you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You can fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward would be heartache and tears if you cheat the guy in the glass. I told myself then, never ever would I cheat myself. If I say I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be a good doctor. I'm gonna be a lawyer, I'm gonna be a good lawyer. If I'm gonna teach school, I'm gonna teach school. But if I be a street sweeper, I'm gonna sweep streets good. And that changed my trajectory, that changed my life. And I came home to Columbus, and uh, no jobs, of course you finish in December. And, uh, but I started all the called Lot, you're familiar with it. Lead us up today and tomorrow. And I found the 20th, 20 brightest young people I could find, 22, 23, 24, 25, you're my age. And we met with all the leaders of, of we were the leaders of tomorrow, we met with all the leaders of today. And my father knew a lot of them. And one of them was the vice mayor of Columbus, and he, A.J. McClung, he mentored me for many, many years. And so we met, and we met, and we met. And um, eventually, uh, I was appointed to the Medical Center Board of Trustees, the first African American, uh, taking the place of a gentleman who had retired. And uh, thereafter, um, I was still looking for a job, so I'm going to have to leave Atlanta, I mean, leave Columbus and move to Atlanta to get a job. So A.J. and George Ford told me, this is my first test of politics, said, meet, meet us at the Labor Department. I said, what's going on? He said, we're going we're gonna to get you a job down there. And so I went to meet them at the Labor Department, went in, and I'll never forget it. Dorothy Bass, Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Bass looked at him and said, we don't have any openings. He said, we, we, you know, uh, we, we'll take his application. And um, Mr. McClone said, get, get Commissioner Sam Caldwell on the phone. I said, what? You want me to call the commissioner? And she, he said, yeah, call the commissioner. So the commissioner answered the phone and said, hey, hey Jay and George, how y'all doing? He said, we got a young man down here in Columbus. We're going to get him involved in politics, but he needs a job to stay here. Well, that's, we can all be able to work that out. So you got a Bible in the room? And I'm just sitting there as a young 23-year-old, not knowing what the heck's going on. And uh, he said, young man, put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. He said, do you swallow this sweater to keep the whole laws of state of Georgia, so help me, God? I said, I do. He said, welcome to the Labor Department. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, what about the state merit exam? He said, son, you're in politics now. Don't ask so many questions. <laughs> That was a Friday. He said, go to work on Monday. And I went to work on Monday, went to work for the Labor Department, and stayed there for about six or eight months. And then uh, went to work for GMAC and ultimately uh, to Sonovas. And uh, during that time, uh, we, we were meeting, and, and Albert Thompson, who was a, a chairman of special judiciary here in this house, and he uh, was talking to us. We, our group was meeting with him. He said, one of y'all ought to run for the state legislature. And I said, no, we're not getting into politics. Uh, we, I saw what politics is all about when I got my job. I said, <laughs> we, we, we not gonna, we're not going to do that. We're going to do community and public service. And uh, so we left his office, and my mentor, A.J. McClung, called me to his house. We lived in the subdivision out of the county. He lived in the subdivision call from us. And uh, he said, you know what, you ought, to, you ought to run. And I uh, said, so let me think about it. He said, no, no, you ought to run. And in fact, uh, you're going to run. And, I, and of course, the vice mayor of Columbus, Georgia, was talking to me. And so we, I did run. And um, uh, it changed my life. And uh, I had a great group of people to help me, and uh, there were five of us in the, in the race, and uh, I won without a runoff. I was, I was blown, I was just blown aback, but it reminds me of that, that uh, quote, plant seeds to trees for the shade you may never see. And that's what we did. We planted seeds to a tree 
for the shade we may never see. And, 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 and I said then that, that I was going to come up here and do the best I could. And, uh, and, and those that helped me along the way. And um, I almost was coming up here and then uh, one of my opponents filed uh, a suit. And um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, I'll never forget uh, Constagian Smith Law Firm here in Atlanta. Keegan Feather was my lawyer and, uh, and went before the Supreme Court. And I was sworn in prior to it and the, the Supreme Court moved, ruled it a moot issue and then I w went on to serve. So, uh, but my, uh, my people that helped me along the way, Benny Neuroff, Robert Anderson, Dan Dolman, Howard Pendleton, the late Scott Wise. Um, Benny Neuroff and Howard Pendleton, I, as Karen and Hugo will tell you, we communicate on a daily basis. Uh, they gonna either call me or text me every day. And, uh, and some days I don't respond. <laughs> but, but, but it was their idea, and one of y'all, you might wanna try this. It said, Smyra for District 92. I had about 2,000 yards signed out. And then the, on the election eve, they changed the yard sign to vote Smyra today. That's pretty clever. You got a yard sign in your yard, Smyra for District 92, and then the next morning you wake up, vote Smyra today. And uh, that went over pretty well, and, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate them and the impact that they've had on my life. For the past 48 years, I have worn this name badge as a badge of honor. Over the years, I've had many, many leadership positions and titles, but being called Dean of this house, while it is the least of power, it is the one I admired the most. And I appreciate the speaker, and I'm deeply honored to Speaker David Rossman for bestowing that recognition and honor to me. Since elected to this house, I have seen and witnessed a lot. After being elected in 1975, I've had only three opponents in 48 years, two Democrats and one Republican. In fact, at one point, I ran 15 consecutive times without opposition in the Democratic or the Republican primary, 30 years, which is a long, long time. That's 30 years without opposition. Now that I reflect back, I consider that quite a feat. I have seen and witnessed a lot. Our state has made much progress and we have made positive gains. In 1975, this house was a different place to serve. I've had, I've seen great strides in diversity and diversity is hard. And since I was elected in 1974 at the age of 24, 27, in my first term, there were only 19 African Americans serving in this body. Today, there are 52. There were only eight women, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight <laughs> women in the house in 75. Today, there are 62 women. <laughs> Which represent diversity as well as members of the LGBTQ community. By far, better diversity. It makes this house looks like and represents Georgia. Yes, you have added it up. In 1975, the People's House was made up of 172 men and eight women. I want to recognize that we've come a long way, and we ought to be proud of where we are as a state. I want to recognize a few people that have helped this turtle get up on the fence post. I warned that out at home. They told me, don't you ever say that in Columbus ever again. Well, y'all have just heard it again, <laughs> those that are listening. But serving in this house has also allowed me the honor of serving with five house speakers. Thomas Murphy, Terry Coleman, Mark Burkhalter, Glenn Richardson, and now speaker David Walston. Terry Coleman, I work well with him, and I want to say this, I thank Terry Coleman for keeping me on as rules chairman 
gentlemen, you get a new speaker, you get a new rules chairman. And, uh, and he allowed me to continue on, and he allowed me to continue on as a member of the Budget Conference Committee as well. And I, and I appreciate that. He, when he became speaker, my mentor, Tom Buck, became chairman of the Appropriations Committee, my seatmate. Thomas B. Murphy, he was my friend, and he had an early impact on my political career. I met him in December 1974 in his office. And you've never been in Tom Murphy's office. It's a treat because it was like a museum. Anybody's been here serving you. And it's at West Georgia now if you ever get that way. But, but um, Albert Thompson set up the appointment. He was chairman of the Special Judiciary, Special Judiciary Committee. And uh, he told me to go to see Murphy, made an appointment. So I went to him and I walked and he said, son, what can I do for you? And I said, well, uh, Representative Thompson said, I need to come to you about committee assignments. He said, yep. He said, you're right about that now. He said, I make all the appointments. I said, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm told that. He said, what do you want to be on? I said, appropriations. He said, he said what? <laughs> appropriations? He said, you're a freshman. He said, not only will you not be on appropriations, you won't be in the room when we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, he said, what's your next one? I said, ways and means. He said, oh, my God, who have you been talking to? I said, you don't, you're a freshman. You don't go on no ways and means. He said, what about your third? I said, banks and banking or health? He said, oh, my goodness, son. I don't know who you've been talking to, but freshmen don't get those committees. But he said, I will. I will look at it and get back with you, and then I got, I got one of them. And then about after the session started, he put his arms around me, and we were somewhere at a reception. He said, you know what? He said, um, I want you to stay close to me. I kind of like you. I said, what did I do, Mr. Speaker? He said, well, you keep your cards close to your chest. And um, he said, a little bird told me that you gave me appropriation of ways and means as your one and two, and you gave me banks and banking and health as three. But really, the banks and banking and health was your number one. So you kind of tricked her. The guy, man, you know, you gave me the two, you knew I wasn't going to point you, so I kind of got soft and gave you the third. So he said, that's pretty, pretty clever. So that was my first time to speak, uh, to, to meet um, uh, Tom Murphy and have an engagement with him. And um, uh, after getting appointed to my committee, uh, we, uh, our first impression was the last impression. Uh, but that started my uh, journey in the House. In four years, which was unheard of back then, he pointed me to Ways and Means, Chairman Blackman. Fourth, my, my, my third term. Two years later, he appointed me to appropriations committee. And at then I told Chairman England, the budget was $4 billion. And I went on appropriation. Four billion, now 30. And uh, so he asked me also uh, to join him in Cartersville. And he said, uh, I said, what's going on there? He said, um, we have a little meeting. We're going. We, we go and elect Joe Frank Harris governor. I said, Joe Frank, sit behind me. He said, Yeah. He said, I, I, Scott, you're in my. I mean, Representative Holcomb, you're in my seat, and uh, Fry is in Joe Frank, and Representative Alexander is in Larry Walker seat. And um, so I joined them in Cartersville, and and uh, and Joe Frank Harris uh, was um, elected governor. And um, uh, Larry Walker, who was uh, my uh, friend and protege, asked me to serve as assistant floor leader. Uh, floor, it's a little bit different nowadays than it was in 1970, 1981 and 82. When Larry Walker became floor leader, he selected the two assistant floor leaders, and I was the one the ones he selected. And so I worked with Larry. And then uh, he became majority leader, and then uh, the governor appointed me floor leader, becoming the first African American in the state. And I went to see Speaker Murphy, and I said, Mr. Speaker, I said, the governor, they were going to ask me to serve as floor leader. Oh, you're leaving me, huh? I said, well, I'm going to still be in the house, <laughs> but the floor leader, that, you know, they always fight me, and, you know, I said, well, I mean, we're we going we to work together. I said, can you, can you go along? He said, yep, we're going to be just like one happy marriage. We're going we're gonna to be all right. 
the first day we introduced Bill was on transportation. And it was Tom Morland was the commissioner. And he called me up to, I'm, I'm just sick of you. Every time I turn around, y'all fight me. And I said, Mr. Speaker, I said, don't do that. You told me it was going to be one happy marriage. Well, well we about to get a divorce. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right here, right now. And uh, so he, he, he left me and went on down to the governor's office and um, he came back. I just talked to your boss and told him the same thing. But, but uh, we had a great relationship. He was a wonderful man. I always tell people, Joe Frank Harris changed the landscape of Atlanta, Georgia. All you got to do is go back and read the history. He changed it. Georgia World Congress Center, Martyr, Georgia World Congress Center, the Dome. I mean, these are things that, that if you run for, if you're in the rural area and you, run, and you were connected to Atlanta, you know, it wasn't no, wasn't no win, you know, back then. And, uh, but he did it and he steadfast. And he was very good to me. He and Bill Lee. Bill Lee was the first rules chairman I, 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 I was on, and Billy Randall and I were uh, on the rules committee together. And, and a gentleman just came in. Thank you, Representative um, Senator Lucas. Lucas and I came together in 1966. That was 60, I mean, 1975. That was 66 legislators in our class. 66, one third of General Assembly. So thank you, Senator Lucas. I appreciate you and your friendship. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> but, but, but the speaker is just, he and Bill Lee were connected, and, and uh, so we went back in well, Speaker uh, Ross's conference room one day, about five or six of us in there, Tom Buck, uh, Bill Lee, Terry Coleman, and myself, because the speaker allowed me to sit with the conferees for 10 years. When the conferees come from 403, come down his conference room, I sat down on the inside and watched them do the budget. I was not on the conference committee, but I sat there for, for nearly 10 years. So when he finally appointed me to the conference committee, I was very, very prepared. But, but on, on the room, one day we were sitting back there, and Bill Lee came in and said in 1990, I'm, I'm getting ready to retire, Mr. Speaker. He said, man, I got the final rules committee chairman. And we were just sitting in the conference room, and, and he, and Terry Coleman and Tom Buck said, Mr. Speaker, that's your rule channel right there. He said, who? He said, you mean Calvin? <laughs> and and I, I thought I was in good stead with him. And, but, but, and they said, yeah, he can do the job. And uh, that's how I was appointed rules chairman. And, um, and Speaker Murphy and I had a, just a great, great relationship. In fact, at one time, I was, on the, I was chair of the rules committee. Chairman of the Democratic House Caucus, Chairman of the Democratic Party, and a member of the Conference Budget Committee all at the same time. Four years of that. And, uh, and one day I said, Mr. Speaker, I said, this is a heavy load. I said, um, I said, maybe somebody else can do one of these jobs. He said, when I wake up in the morning, son, I'm going to have to call but two people, and you one of them. I said, who's the other one? He said, Terry Coleman, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. If you know where the money is and where the bills are, you have a pretty good day as a speaker. <laughs> and so it stayed that way. But, but, uh, but he was just a wonderful person, and uh, I miss him, and, and I appreciate all the contributions that he made to my career. Speaker David Ralston. First and number one, he is my friend. We are from different political parties, but we share a common bond. As you know, a lot of y'all may recall, I was nominated for speaker as chairman of the Minority Caucus and lost 116 to 58. <laughs> Not a close race to Speaker Ralston. Losing the votes of 11 Democrats. I was disappointed, but I understood. 30 minutes went by and I forgot they even voted against me. Because the person you're angry with on Monday, you may need them on Thursday. Hello, somebody. The object of this game is 91 and 120. Ain't no else way you can shake it or bake it. That's it. 
you can't find 90 people, then it's, you, you, you talking, but you, you just kicking the can. If you find 90, then you filling the can. And I've tried to be one who fills the can. But Speaker Ralston, uh, in his address, he stated this, and I quote, we are at a point that is both unprecedented and unexpected. As a house and state, we face great challenges. There will no doubt be obstacles thrown in our path, but I truly believe this chamber is filled with good leaders. Public service is both noble and honorable. I also promise a new beginning with the city of Atlanta. Atlanta has a new leader, and I promise to work with the city and move all of Georgia forward. I said in my speech, and I quote, I don't expect to win today by popular vote, but the mere fact that I am a candidate is a victory for democracy and the minority party. Spalls go to the winner, but whether you win or you lose, politics ought to be about being open and participatory politics and policy. I don't suffer from the illusion of inclusion but I do expect the decency of participating in this house. No one can break your back unless you bend it. So I intend on standing strong, and I will continue to stand for what I believe in and forever, forever honor the institution of this house, which I serve. While we were friends prior to that Monday, January 12th, 2010, that day seemed to have made our friendship more of a fixture. We will go forward and for the next 12 years would work on many transformational issues for our state. The Transportation Act of 2015 tested our relationship. Uh, Jay Roberts and Mark Hamilton and I were in the office and um, we had to build there and Carolyn Hughley and Al Williams and Stacey Abrams and two or three others walked into my office in CLOB and said, uh, uh, we need to talk to you. I said, what's that? I said, we need for you not to sign the transportation bill. I said, I, I, I said excuse me? I, I said, the speaker wants me to sign that bill. I said, they said, if you sign the bill, it will give this signal uh, because of your bandwidth. You know, but we need to be able to negotiate and work this together with the Republican and with the minority. I went back to see the speaker and told him that I thought our friendship was about to be torn apart. Didn't he? <laughs> but he looked at me and I said this to him. I said, do you trust me? I said, do you trust me? His words to me, I trust you. I said, I'll see you the same you die. And we worked together both sides of the aisle and we worked on the, on the Transportation Act and to me, the Transportation Act is transform transformational. It has made this state, we, we used to run transportation on continual resolution from the United States Congress. Now we have money that we can 10 year plan. And to me, that is a great thing for the state of Georgia. And on the last day of signing he died, he gave me a lot of recognition of being one of the ones that helped pass the transportation bill. And I appreciate that. Well, I worked very hard with Jay Roberts and with Mark Hamilton and the Transportation Committee. I was not on transportation. He didn't know it till last year. I said, he said, we got a transportation bill coming. I said, I'm not on the Transportation Committee. He said, oh my Lord, I didn't know that. And, and uh, Rick Jasper said, he's not on this committee. And then the speaker said, well, I'm putting him on there now. So, I, so I've been on transportation for one year, but, but <laughs> after all of the transit bill and everything else, but, but I'm finally on it. Because um, the permanent tr uh, transit funding, in fact, I called a speaker one day, I said, Mr. Speaker, I said, we ought to do something about transit in this state. I said, far too long. Transit is a quality of life issue. It affects a lot of people in their livelihood. And he said, what you got in mind? I said, put $200 million in the budget. He looked at me, he said, he said you need to go see the governor about that, $200 million. So I went to see the governor, told the governor the same thing, and uh, you know, I was surprised because speaker was kind of positive about it. And uh, Dill looked at me and said, we'll do 100 million. I said, 200 million. He said, no, he said, 50 million. <laughs> and he went down on me. 
I said, 100 million. He said, that's why, that's why I was in the first place. I said, okay, so, so uh, um, he put $100 million in the budget. So one morning, my phone rang. It was Speaker Ralph, uh, you need to see the governor. I said, what's going on? He said, I'd I rather for him to tell you. And so I called the governor, and uh, they wanted to use $25 million for economic development, but we had planned that the $75 million was all we could use uh, uh, through the uh, transit system anyway, so we are able to get $75 million for transit for the first time through bond. And then the speaker said, you know what, we ought to find a way to fund the transit period. And thus 511 and Kevin Tanner and those that, that helped out uh, in that regard. And, uh, and now we have a bill where transit is funded for the first time. You can't think about that. All these years, we never funded transit in the state of Georgia. But thanks to this gentleman behind me, David Ralston, we now fund transit. And thanks to all of you, and to me, that's a quality of life. The hate crime bill, Wendell Willard, Chuck Estration, Karen Bennett, Megan Hansen. I remember driving to Brunswick, and I talked halfway to, to this gentleman right here, one of my best friends that I have in life, Al Williams. And we talked about it, and we drove in different cars. Reverend Hugh was on the way, I was on my way. It was in the thick of COVID. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to go, but I woke up the morning, I said, I got to go to Brunswick. She had already left. When I drove down there, and on the way, Gloria Frazier, Representative Frazier called me, and she was with the mother of Armand Arbery, Wanda Cooper. And we talked for a few minutes and, uh, uh, about the situation. And my first call was to Speaker David Ralston. I said, we need to do something about citizen arrest. He said, well, we got to first pass hate crimes. And, uh, and uh, so we did pass hate crimes, and then First thing I did, I called uh, Armand Arbery and mother, Representative Hogan, and I told her that, that uh, I make your promise. We get past hate crime, we're going to take citizen arrest the next year. And I said, I promise you that. I'll give you my word. And lo and behold, I see the speaker, and he is in agreement, and we passed the, the Citizens Act and uh, citizen arrest. And thanks to Governor Kemp and Bert Reeves and William Bodie and, and many, many others. The Atlanta airport, because it was a major issue for me in the city of Atlanta, we were able to stop that situation. Cannabis, cannabis, medical marijuana. When Alan Peake called me maybe seven, eight years ago and asked me to sign a bill, I told him I, I wouldn't. And I, I just got my plate full and uh, and then I, he told me one day to go to a mall just to see. And I saw parents going to cars, buying from the black market cannabis oil. And by that time, this gentleman right here, Michael Gravely, was uh, taking on the issue. And uh, uh, I want to tell you, that's one of my best joys that I have. Is, is, is working with you in passing the medical cannabis bill. That was, that was something that, to me, it was a great deal in seeing these parents and their eyes and what we were doing for their children. It was just something that, to me, I felt, I felt a decency in me that to be able to, to do that. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the speaker. I, speaker Rawson has pointed me to more conference committees than I served as a Democrat. Think about that. Other than the conference budget committee, I was on it every year for six years. But any other committees, Ralston had put me on more conference committees than I've served as a Democrat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the trust and working relationship into serving on the rules, the appropriations, higher ed, and transportation. You appointed me to the Georgia World Congress Center Board, the Special Committee on Access to Quality Health Care. The Special Commission Committee on Election Integrity, the Sp Special Committee on Access to Civil Justice System, and the Georgia Freight and Logist Logistics Infrastructure Funding Commission. So I appreciate all that you have done, and I appreciate our friendship, and I'm looking forward to keeping in touch with you as a friend, uh, whatever my road leads me to in, in the near future. Serving in this house, also has allowed me to serve with 
seven governors, four Democrats, three Republicans. George Busby, because George Busby was the first governor that could run for re-election. We had one term. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter was our last one-term governor, and George Busby was the first governor to be able to run for two terms. And um, Joe Frank Harris, Zell Miller, Roy Barnes, Sonny Perdue, Nathan Dill, and now Governor Brian Kemp. Governor Joe Frank Harris, I co-chaired his inauguration. We had a great relationship. I would come, become his floor leader. Uh, and um, he, uh, he and I and Larry Walker worked together on a lot, a lot of uh, issues. And, uh, and working for Governor Harris was a wonderful working experience. Uh, I was on the QBE commission to establish the quality of basic education here in the state of Georgia. It changed our educational system. I worked with him uh, on passing the legislation that created the Georgia Dome. I was the floor leader at that time and helped work the bill through the House and the Senate. Was a heavy lift and a two year journey. And at that time, the dome cost $200 million. Think about that. The one we're looking at now is $1.6 billion. So we built the, the, the Falcons' first home was $200 million. That kept the Falcons in Atlanta. And I tell people all the time, and I get a lot of criticism for that, but you lose a professional team. You just lose one and see what happens. You just lose a, every team that has lost one. They know it was just catastrophic for their state. So sometimes we have to make hard decisions. And that was a hard decision, creating a dome stadium for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, and I took a lot of heat from my Columbus delegation members, uh, might not remember this, but um, Miss George is held in Columbus every year. And they were having, having it at the old municipal auditorium. And it started to rain in pretty hard. So they had a lot of umbrellas. So as the ladies were walking on stage, they had the umbrellas to hold them. <laughs> and my Lord, that was a bad picture. So one reporter wrote this. I won't say who his name is. But he said, now, he can build a dome for the Falcons, but he can't build a civic center for a city. Oh my goodness, that, that hit home hard. The first call I made was to Tom Buck, and the second call I made was to Frank Martin. And that was in 1972. In 1974, we broke ground for a $45 million civic center in Columbus, Georgia. And I was just happy to be at that river cut. <laughs> The, the same face with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the Columbus people. So now we have one. And, uh, and the last thing, I, I, I want to thank Governor Harris for his commitment on the Martin Luther King Jr. birthday, the state holiday. And I stand here today on the birthday, I mean the assassination of Dr. King. Dr. King was um, assassinated April the 4th, 1960, 54 years ago. So it's apropos, I, I never met Dr. King. I met Daddy King one time, his father, but I never met Dr. Martin Luther King. In fact, when he was killed, I, we were summoned to a gym in Fort Valley State University. We had a, a service there. And, uh, but when we created the State Holiday Commission, um, Secretary of State Max Cleland was the first chair, and I was his vice chair. And he agreed to only serve for one year. And then for 10 years, I chaired the State Holiday Commission, uh, Dr. King State Holiday Commission, and I got a chance to work very, very closely with his widow, Coretta Scott King. So I want to say today that we appreciate the life and legacy of, of, of Dr. King. But the holiday bill, I got a lot of credit for it, but Jose Williams and Tyrone Brooks for many years introduced the bill. And when Joe Frank, when Governor Harris became governor, he asked me to do it and they signed on and uh, it, was a, it was a joyous day that I can always remember. And, um, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm just so happy 38 years now, we, with your help, we just passed Juneteenth as a state holiday. And uh, once I went on, <laughs> I went over to the Senate and they presented me with two resolutions that allowed me to speak to the Senate. And, uh, and I thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Duncan for, for that honor, allowing me to do a farewell address in the, in the state Senate on, on Friday. Uh, another honor to me that's, that's real difficult for me to, to, to describe to you. And the last governor I want to mention is Roy Barnes. 
uh, Roy and, um, and Governor Harris had a luncheon for me approximately two weeks ago and invited approximately 12 of senior members back and we had a great opportunity to chat and to be uh, to, to break bread together and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, I was at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 2000 and my phone rang and it was Governor Barnes saying that uh, when I get back we're going to change the state flag. And uh, I didn't think much of it at that time. And uh, when we got back, uh, he called me to his office. And I, I, I told him that Zell Miller barely won uh, re-election. And he didn't try to pay. He just mentioned it. <laughs> and and uh, he just said, I, I, I want to do it. And that I want to do it, um, he won by 31,000 votes, uh, Zell Miller did. And, uh, but, uh, but I pr what a profile in courage and conviction. And uh, I'll never forget, I was in, um, I was in um, Milledgeville and had to get back and got a helicopter to land me on the lawn of, of the governor's mansion. And I walked in and the governor was in there with about 12, 15 CEOs of Georgia. He said, this is the rules chairman here and uh, we're going to pass the bill out of his committee in the morning. And I said, well, I got to talk to Speaker Murphy about that, Governor. I mean, we can't just call him. He said, I've already talked to the Speaker. He's on board. I said, well, I got to contact my committee. He said, they'll get a memo at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, Governor, that's kind of, can kind of be kind of tough to do. He said, no, we're doing it in the morning. And uh, I went to 403 and I walked in. I've never seen a, such a bank of, of, of uh, microphones ever in my political career and we voted to be allowed and uh, and um, uh, I commend Governor Barnes for taking that action and uh, and I worked with him on so many many issues and uh, and he was a truly truly blessed for his friendship the last one I want to mention is Zell Miller I served in the house with Zell I mean when Zell was governor and uh, for the lottery, and uh, I wrote with Governor Miller to buy the first lottery ticket, and I thought that was quite an honor. And uh, but the lottery has changed this state in so many good ways, and all of you all are responsible for that, for these young people getting a, a college education. Education is the escalator to up mobility. It is the key to all keys for people to be a more productive life and live as citizens of this state of Georgia. So, so, so the lottery is a good piece, it's something that we need to continue to, to work on and to work um, to make it better, better every day. Serving this house also has allowed me to honor serving with nine U.S. presidents, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And I have served with nine presidents, I, I said, and I visited with seven of them in, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the White House. And I'm deeply, deeply honored, both Republican and Democrats. I'll never forget getting a call from the White House and Ronald Reagan wanted to meet with a few of us state legislators on welfare reform. And I got criticized by going to meet with the president, but I, I, I informed them at that time, if any president calls me, I'm going to see him, period. I don't care who it is. I'm going, if the president of the United States calls you, I'm going. So now if y'all want to keep raising that saying, you can do what you want to do, but it ain't going to change me, not one iota. And, and I don't care what you do, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to meet with him. So I flew up there and then one, 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 one had no shame and came back and stood in my district like I always do. And I always, um, you know, I think, when I think about the late George H. Bush, his wife served on our board at the Morehouse School of Medicine, Barbara Bush. And I got to know the Bushes very, very well. And uh, one day, uh, Dr. Sullivan, we were getting ready for the Morehouse School of Medicine, and he called me and said, I got a dilemma. I said, what, what's the dilemma? He said, they want me to second the nomination of George, uh, President Bush for his nomination at the convention in New Orleans. And I just don't know what, Tom, what Speaker Murphy's gonna say. I said, can I give you a little advice? I said, don't walk to New Orleans, run. 
I said, you let me take care, speak of Murphy. And I talked to Murphy and I told him it was the right thing to do and, and um, our president became HHS secretary, Lou Sullivan, and was a big, big thing for the state of Georgia. So I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with that and I've been, it's been my joy to uh, serve with, with all of them. And, uh, and in closing, uh, I, I just say to you, I consider um, it an honor. Public service is noble and honorable. And um, my love is for the Rules Committee, and I've served with five Rules Chairman, uh, Bill Lee, Earl Earhart, John Meadows, uh, Jay Powell, and now Richard Smith from my hometown. And Richard, I want to thank you for all the courtesies you extended to me. And I appreciate that you and Claire have been dear friends and I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. Appropriations Committee, I've served with quite a few chairs. Joe Frank Harris, Bubba McDonald, Ben Harbin, Terry Coleman, and, uh, and uh, Terry Ingram. And um, Terry, thank you all of that that you've done and assisted with me. You've never turned me down. Well, you've turned me down on, on offers, <laughs> but you never turned down to meet with me. Yeah, but you hadn't, you, you, I don't want to make it be make mistaken that you hadn't turned me down. The conferees, y'all have turned me down. <laughs> but it's more good than, 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 than bad, and for that I'm, I'm uh, deeply, deeply honored, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and you all know how much I love Fort Valley State University. And, um, and uh, Fort Valley has been great to me, and I thank you all for the support that you all have given Fort Valley and all the HBCUs here in the state of Georgia through our, our budgetary process. At the Mohawk School of Medicine, I remember in 1979 when we first talked about Mohawk School of Medicine, and I remember when we, when we, when we appropriated the first billion dollars, a billion, million, <laughs> I wish it was a big first million dollars to Mohawk School of Medicine, and 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 your support has been unwavering, and and I am thankful for that. The speaker's office, thank you very much, Spiro. You've been a friend and a commandant. I appreciate you uh, uh, for all that. Um, and I know Sundays, you, you know, I would I would text you on a Sunday and a Saturday, and uh, you would text me back and. Uh, People don't know it, but a lot of legislation get done over the weekend. <laughs> well, a lot of things happen. And uh, um, uh, Kathy Little, uh, she's a, just been a friend for a long, long time, her and her daughter, uh, Kennedy, and Michelle uh, Spearman, and Betsy, uh, our messenger, Thorox. Caleb, thank you so much for all that you've uh, done. and. And um, Kayla walked up to me in Dahlonegan and said, uh, the speaker wants you to ride back with him in the car. I said, what's going on? He said, uh, I'll let him tell you. So I got in the car and he, he looked back in the back and said, I got, want you to nominate me for speaker. I second my nomination. And, uh, and I didn't hesitate. I said, I'll do it. And uh, he says, we got one problem. You can't tell anybody. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. I don't know about that. So the Sunday before the election, I said, there's no way for me to leave that seat and walk down here and nominate without giving the, my leader and my leadership knowledge of it. And so I went to see uh, Stacey Abrams and all our other members and told them what I was going to do it was not an issue. So thank you for that, uh, Caleb and Keith and Deidre Powell, all of the members of the speaker's office, thank you for all that you do. I've only served with three clerks. You might think, that's, I get three in 48 years, but that's, that's it. Jack Ellick served a long, long time. And um, um, Robbie Rivers, uh, the speaker and I both spoke at Robbie's uh, home going. And our clerk now, Bill Riley and they do such a wonderful job. And I want y'all to give them a round of applause and thank them for all that they do. And uh, the doorkeepers, thank you, Pat, and all the, the doorkeepers. Uh, y'all do such a great job. Yeah. 
And uh, I took a picture with the doorkeepers, and, uh, and I signed it, every one of them, and I love them, and I appreciate them. Back in the day when I was elected, the, the doorkeeper used to be former, uh, former members of the legislature. And, uh, and that, that happened for a long time. And now uh, uh, having uh, uh, floor leaders that are not legislated is, is a good deal because the floor leaders that were legislated, sometimes they wouldn't want to get the door. <laughs> You'll come up to the door, and, and I said, I said, what's the problem here? He said, well, you know, I said, I said you're not a legislature. You, you're a used to bird. He said, what is a used to bird? I said, a used to bird don't make no suit. <laughs> so open the door, you know. But that's how it was back in the day with, with our colleagues. Um, and my seatmates, Billy Mitchell, Beverly, oh, boy, have you ever sit there, these two? Uh, but uh, Tom Buck and uh, Nikki Randall, I love Nikki Randall. Um, she served for 12 years. I, I held Nikki Randall when she was two years old over there in that window. When she was two, and now she don't got here and she gone. So I know it's time for, for, me, for me to go. Uh, my sweet mates, Carol and Hughley, lady that I love and appreciate and who's taught me so much who's been such a shoulder to me and such an ear to me. I can't, I can't fathom, I can't tell you how much she's meant to me. Uh, uh, when I used to talk to her about my family situation and, and all of that, and talk to her about my grandchildren, and uh, she's always been, been giving me that motherly advice, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, Darshan Kendrick, uh, Viola Davis, Becky Evans, Eric Allen, who came to visit me today, and I'm, I appreciate your courtesies, Eric, and Miriam Parrish. Those are the people that serve with me now. And my administrative assistants, uh, Cheryl Jackson has been just a, I mean, just, you know. <laughs> she's been just a wonderful person, and I, I thank her and her, her husband uh, Stephanus, uh, for their courtesy to extend to me. Thank you for helping with the farewell reception they held in my honor recently, and I'm just really, really thankful. And the first as assistant I ever hired was Leisha Johnson. Y'all remember Leisha, she worked for the speaker. But she was my first administrative assistant. And I'll tell you this, uh, I had hip replacement in 93, and when I woke up, her husband was at my bedside holding my hand and praying for me. And that's a special person that would leave their home in Atlanta and drive to Columbus and visit me at my bedside. And, and we share a great bondship there. And uh, Janice Wages, the late wages, I used to um, work with upstairs. And, um, uh, and uh, sometime I get up because Bruce Williamson is in my old office on the fourth floor. I, I really. If, if, uh, I enjoyed that office. That's where the majority of the uh, leader's office was at that time. And uh, my chairman, uh, um, um, Chuck Martin, is, uh, is uh, in my old office on the fourth floor where I used to hang out as well. And, and I want to thank my transportation chairman, uh, Rick Jasper, for, for uh, his work in this house as, as well. And the last thing I want to say is that the media. I want to thank the media. Uh, uh, I want to thank the news media. They have a role they play. And overall, I've had a good relationship with the, the members of the media. Uh, in fact, some of them are dear friends uh, from the media. And uh, y'all know my love and appreciation for Jim Galloway. In fact, Speaker Ross and I you had a resolution on, on Galloway, and I appreciate him, and I thank all of the others that, that I've, I've had a chance to uh, interact with, um, Rick Allen and Prentice Palmer and Richard Elliott, Neil Bortz, um, um, uh, Jane Saucer, Celeste Steen Sibley, Bill Nygut, and Dick Pettis and Aaron Haynes from the Associated Press who assisted me over the years. How can you measure a 48-year career in the Georgia House? Is it by the number of bills you introduce or pass? Is it by the positions you hold? I don't think so. 
You measure your career by how you honor this institution. And I honor the House of Representatives, this institution. I've always paid honor to this institution called the Georgia House of Representatives, and I shall always. What will I miss not being in here with you all? I got my top 10. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you my top 10. 10, being chairman of the Columbus Legislative Delegation. <laughs> I'm gonna miss that, that's one of my top 10. I've worked with all these members here and I love them dearly because they have put up with me for I don't know how many years I've been chairman, but I wanna thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Representative Hewley, Representative Buckner, Representative Smith, you all been so great. I'm gonna miss all these old days like Omega Day, AKA Day, Delta Day, all them days at the Capitol, Alpha Day, I'm gonna miss it, where's my friend Kim Schofield? Lupus Day, uh, Sickle Cell Day with Glory Frazier. I'm gonna miss all my days here, and, uh, but, I will, but I enjoy coming as well, honoring those different days. Uh, good morning, Al Williams, how are you? Best day of my life. <laughs> it's the best day of my life. I've heard that so many times that uh, I, I'm thinking it is the best day. Every day is the best day of your life. Any day you get up, you ought to thank God. Any day, because some people don't wake up. And uh, so thank you, Al, for your friendship and for working with you. We met in 1975, and uh, we're still friends, and we're still uh, working together, and, and I appreciate that. Number seven. All members, please take your seat and cease audible conversation. I'm gonna wake up one of these days just <laughs> thinking about hearing that. All members, take your seat and cease audible conversation. Um, uh, I'm gonna miss this right here. Can you call the speaker for me? Uh, or the rules chairman? <laughs> or the chairman of the appropriation committee? Can you, can you put in a good word for me? I'm gonna miss all of those. Uh, not being able to go to Busy B, my favorite soul food restaurant. I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss that. Number three, what purpose does the gentleman rise? <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> I rise and make a motion, but speak, you're not all, you're not recognized. <laughs> <laughs> a rules committee meeting. We have a rules committee meeting in ten minutes. I'm gonna miss that every morning. I'm gonna miss having that. And then the last thing I'm gonna miss is Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. It's been such a great ride. It's been, I've seen so many of you all and gotten to know you and appreciate you over the years. I've had some great memories of some dear friends. I was at Jay Powell's um, a dedication the other day and got to talk with, with Demetrius Douglas and, and he spoke at, at the ceremony and, uh, and, and he, he, we talked about family and I appreciate you Demetrius, you've been a dear friend and, uh, and just standing there that minute talking about family is always something that's been, it's been dear to me and I would not have been able to serve up here had it not been for Sonovas. Sonovas has been my rock. I uh, went to work for that company in 1976, uh, and uh, I, I had lost my job at another company because of the action that I voted in on in here, and I lost my job. And I came up here in 1976, when I went home in 1975, and uh, lost my job in April of 75 after the session, and I, I came back up here unemployed. And um, I went home unemployed. I was living off a, I know you all don't know anything, but I was living off a 90-day note. Now you roll them over and get another thousand. You roll them over, you get another thousand. But I lived like that for over a year on, 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 90, on notes. And uh, one day I was walking into CB&T on Broadway and Jimmy Blanchard was walking out. He said, how you doing, Representative? I said, I'm fine, Jimmy, how are you? I said, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm fine, I said, but I'm still looking for a job. 
He stopped and said, you, you hadn't found a job since you left the, com the company. I said, no, sir. He walked back inside. He said, cancel my luncheon. Tell him, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't be there. He said, come into my office. I went in his office and I talked to him. At that time, it was Columbus Bank and Trust Company. And um, he said, he looked me in the eye and said, if you come to work for me, you'll never regret it. And you'll never regret it. And I'll never forget, I went from a trainee to executive vice president, a member of the governor's board of the company, and president of the Sonoma's Foundation. And when I became executive vice president, he gave me one of the biggest lessons I ever could get from a person. He walked in my office and said, congratulations. He said, we've got 10,000 employees, five states, and you're the highest ranking African American in the company. He said, but do me a favor. He said, stick your chest out. And I stuck it out. He said, no, stick it out. I stuck it out. And then he said, no, stick it out. And he said, I let it go. He said, no, I don't stick it out no more. <laughs> he said, if you could get here being you, why change? He said, a lot of people get to these lofty positions and they become somebody else. He said, but if you just stay you, you'll be all right. And I appreciate that from him. And he was just a wonderful person. And to speak in Georgia, I just got to read one thing. I've gotten so many notes from people, so many. And I just want to read one. It moved me this morning. And I don't want to say who it is because, but I just want to read what they sent me. Good morning, my friend. I know you think back over the last almost 50 years of service in public life, you're reflecting back over your life. And as my mom would say, you're probably very full. Calvin, your resume is very impressive. You have walked among the highest of men and women in our nation. You have been granted great, great opportunities and favor in your life. As you'll leave this journey serving in the Georgia House of Representatives of 48 years and start on your new journey, I wish you the best that God has to offer. Tonight, as I listen to the news about you and your many accomplishments that I looked at over the news tonight, I think back over our friendship and what you have given me. I recognize your service to the community, but I must say that your kind heart has been more impressive to me than anything. I have seen you grant grace and mercy to some who probably didn't deserve it, but you gave it. Calvin, I have watched you take the high road in almost a lot of political events and community activities, and you have encouraged me to do the same. Your forgiving nature has been a strength that I am continuing to work on every day inside of me to make me a better person. Calvin, in the second book of Luke chapter one, verse five, as Paul is in prison before him, being put to death and writes to Timothy about his unfaith, say, faith, genuine faith that was instilled in him by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. As I am called to remember the unfaith faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and thus I am persuaded it dwell in thee also. Calvin, I see that faith so much in you. I don't know who instilled that faith in you, but that faith you have in mankind but I have seen it over and over and over again, and that is why I love you. God speaks, young man, as you focus on your new direction and now have continued your service in the Georgia House of Representatives. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield the well.
we're going to we have one announcement and then I know we have a presentation but there are, will be got a little event going on downstairs in just a few minutes and some of us need to leave chair recognizes uh, chairman Mitchell for an announcement Mr. Speaker, just before we make this presentation, the, the, the Democratic Caucus will meet in 216 for a brief meeting and lunch. And we'll call it. After the presentation, the House will be in recess until 2.30. Mr. Speaker, we're going to be joined by the members of the Columbus delegation and uh, the chair of the Democratic Caucus, Billy Mitchell. Um, Calvin Smyre is uh, such a great American, a great statesman, and the speaker has graciously consented to have a painting of Mr. Smyre hung in this Capitol. And we have the artist here, Mr. Stephen Tett. Take your hat off. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we would like to make the presentation at this time. Mr. Mr. Tett's going to do the honors. Mr. Mitchell is going to say something right quick. Very quickly, uh, this couldn't have been done without the generosity, certainly, of the speaker, as well as uh, some of our corporate pa partners, Malcolm Smith from Aflac in Columbus, Billy Linville from Lexicon Strategies, Calvin Booker, retired waste management, and myself. With that, let's make the unveiling. As a result of the speakers commissioning this, uh, this will be permanently hung in the Capitol hallway. We, <laughs> we also have bag boxes in a basket full of your comments and your well wishes. They're overflowing and they're just a way for us as individuals to say thanks for the memory to Calvin. I mean Representative Smyrie, the Dean. 